we left off here, I was talking about the different categories of hormones and hormones are categorized based on their chemistry. And there are hormones that dissolve in water. Man, I really need a haircut. <laughs> okay. There are hormones that dissolve in water and they're called water soluble. And there are hormones that don't dissolve in water and they are called lipid soluble. We, we already went over that at the end of the last video. Now, the lipid-soluble ones, most of them are steroid hormones, but there are exceptions. Um, a hormone that is uh, not a steroid hormone, but is hydrophobic, doesn't dissolve in water, is thyroid hormone, write it down, it's on the exam, okay? But we will get to the water-soluble ones in a minute. In the meantime, uh, let's look at all of the steroid hormones. Now, whenever someone says steroid hormones, everyone immediately thinks about the stuff that baseball players are not supposed to inject themselves with, right? But that is not what steroid hormones are. Uh, steroid hormones are hormones that have the chemical structure of a steroid ring. And that chemical structure is this. You know, everywhere there's a corner, there'd be a carbon. Carbon there, carbon there, carbon there, carbon there, right? So that is a six-sided ring of carbon. Here's another six-sided ring of carbon. Here's a third hexagon of carbon. And here's a pentagon of carbon. See that structure? That is what makes that molecule a steroid molecule. That one in blue up there, that is cholesterol. Cholesterol is made by your body, and one of the reasons that your body makes cholesterol is so it is able to make steroid hormones. All of the hormones that fall into this category of steroid hormones that you have, you made starting out with a molecule of cholesterol. No cholesterol in your body, none of these steroid hormones in your body. And what are these steroid hormones? Well, the ones that are shown here in pink, those are female reproductive hormones, progesterone, and estrogen or estradiol. This one here in dark blue, testosterone, that's the one everyone thinks of when the newspapers say steroid hormones or steroids, right? That's testosterone. What is this one in yellow? It's not pink, it's not blue. So what is it there for? That is cortisol and cortisol is one of your hormones of chronic stress. And then we have got this one, aldosterone and aldosterone regulates how much sodium there is in your body. If you have more aldosterone in your body, your body will retain sodium and retain water. Less aldosterone, your body loses sodium and loses water, right? Now, when you look at them, you think to yourselves, they don't look that different. As a matter of fact, let's look at testosterone and estrogen. They don't hardly look different at all. The only difference between testosterone and estrogen is this uh, methyl group is not there, and this one is what's called aromatized. So they're very, very similar molecules. As a matter of fact, a woman's ovaries makes progesterone, turns it into testosterone, then turns that into estrogen, all right? And the uh, a man's uh, tes testes, make progesterone, turn that into testosterone. And, and actually a man's testes will turn some of that testosterone into estrogen. And that is why in every woman's body, you will find testosterone, but mostly estrogen. And in every man's body, you will find estrogen along with testosterone, okay? Something else I was gonna tell you about these guys. Hopefully it'll come to me. Anyway, I should also mention this guy, vitamin D. You see vitamin D, it's, it's winging around kind of fast, but it has got uh, a few of these ring-like structures. It is not a steroid, but it is a lipid-soluble molecule. And vitamin D is made by your skin, and technically it affects other parts of your body. So we also consider it to be a hormone. There won't be any questions on the exam about it, but it's a hormone, all right? Let's see, hormone chemistry. The water-soluble ones, we'll get to there in a second. So all of these molecules on this page, they're all steroid molecules, and all of them, except for cholesterol, are steroid hormones. Progesterone, steroid hormones. Cortisol, steroid hormones. 
aldosterone, steroid hormone, right? Now, let me tell you something else. If you ever go into the hospital for any kind of a health problem and the doctor prescribes a steroid cream or a steroid to you, dollars to donuts, it has nothing to do with testosterone. That is such an old lady thing to say, dollars to donuts. <laughs> it is a safe bet that it is not a, testo a testosterone-like steroid that they're giving you. It is almost always going to be a relative of cortisol. When your grandmother has got rheumatoid arthritis and needs steroids, it is a relative of cortisol. When your kid has got bad asthma and needs a steroid inhaler, it is a relative of cortisol. When you have got a really bad rash and you need a steroid cream, it is a relative of cortisol. It's always going to be a relative of cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid, but cortisol actually in high doses will make your muscles go away. Makes your muscles go away. Makes you store body fat. It is in some ways the opposite of testosterone, but still a steroid hormone. All right. Now let's talk about some water-soluble hormones. The water-soluble hormones are generally going to be proteins like insulin. This is insulin here or peptides. Remember, peptides are just really, really short proteins, right? Um, proteins are like, you know, a hundred or more amino acids big, and peptides are usually like fewer than 20. Don't memorize those numbers because peptides are just really tiny proteins. And uh, amines. Amines are relatives of amino acids. So all related to each other, all water soluble. And that includes insulin. Here's insulin. You know, me and protein structure, I'm sorry. But here is the way insulin gets made. One protein chain. So the, the primary structure got flipped around, and now we've got this uh, uh, secondary and tertiary structure. And then there are covalent bonds made between parts of that chain. And then this chunk that is colored in green gets cut out and voila, we've got insulin. It took us a long time to figure this out. I just get excited about it for reasons I will restrain myself from explaining. All right, now, as you're thinking about hormones, you need to be thinking about negative feedback loops. At the end of this set of lectures, we will have specific questions about how would a doctor diagnose that someone's got a tumor of their anterior pituitary that's causing their body to make too much cortisol, right? And you can intuit all of that by thinking about negative feedback loops, right? So keep that in mind. One of the concepts that I want you to understand, one of my cats does not want me to finish this lecture. Uh, one of the concepts that is important for you to understand is the concept of target cells. Hormones are molecules that will travel in your blood. Hormone communication molecules, they will go everywhere that your blood goes. They go everywhere in your body, almost. Right? And yet, not every cell in your body will respond to every hormone. You know, I told you that aldosterone, it regulates how much sodium is in your body. Yes, this one, this one. She wants to go outside, don't you? Yes, you do, are you bad? I thought so, okay. Um, so uh, I told you that one of the steroid hormones, well, though it was aldosterone, and it could make you retain salt, and it does that by only affecting cells in the kidney. Wait, it goes everywhere. It goes to the kidney and it goes to your eyeballs and it goes to your liver and it goes to your muscles. It goes everywhere. Why is it that only your kidney cells will get that message? It's because only your kidney cells have got a protein which is able to fit that particular hormone so that the hormone can affect the cell. So I have put together these really amateurish animations to demonstrate the concept 
of signaling molecules target cells and um, hydrophobic hydrophilic hormones, okay? So we have got two different hormones here. We have got a yellow hormone. Let's imagine that this is insulin and it looks like a little yellow triangle. That's going to be insulin. It is hydrophilic and since it is hydrophilic, here's the blue watery part of the blood. It can dissolve in water because it's hydrophilic. Now these things that look like little orange Pac-Mans, orange, pink, I don't know, Pac-Mans, those are, let's make them, let's make them aldosterone, okay? That's steroidal hormone and they are hydrophobic. Since they are hydrophobic, they do not dissolve in the watery part of the blood. So since the blood is mostly water, how do they get from where they are made to where they will have their effect? The answer is they will jump on board rafts. So these purple rectangles here, they represent hydrophilic proteins. Remember hydrophilic means does dissolve in water. Yes, it's true that these little orange Pac-Mans, they don't decide dissolve in water. So they would have difficulty getting from where they are made to where they are going. But these hydrophilic proteins, these little protein rafts, as it were, they do dissolve in water. So aldosterone or any hydrophobic hormone would jump onto a hydrophilic raft. Write that down because that's going to be on the exam, not the raft part, but that hydrophobic hormones travel through the bloodstream by, a, by traveling on hydrophilic pro proteins. All right, so we have got two different hormones, hydrophilic, like insulin, yellow triangle, hydrophobic, orange Pac-Man, like, um, like aldosterone. And the purple rectangles, those are hydrophilic proteins that allow the hydrophobic hormones to travel through the bloodstream. Now we've got three cells. Cell one is a target cell for insulin, this one, but it is not a target cell for little Miss Pac-Man, okay? Cell two is not a target cell for either hormone. Cell three, is a target cell for the orange Pac-Man hormone, but not for the yellow triangle hormone, okay? Why? Because when insulin, wait, who's first? Ah, when aldosterone gets to these target cells, and by the way, it would go through all three of the target cells. It would, it would be in there too, in here too. But when it gets into these cells, it will only find a protein that fits it here in the target cell. Notice that this navy blue little square, that is representing a receptor protein. Or we would say that cell number three has got a receptor for that hormone, but cell one and cell two do not have a receptor for that hormone. We have a tendency to say don't have a receptor when what we mean is don't have a receptor protein. All right. So before I go too much farther, uh, the disadvantage of being a hydrophobic or steroidal like hormone is that you cannot easily travel from where you were made to where you will have your effect because you're going through the blood. The blood is mostly water, but that problem gets solved because they travel on hydrophilic proteins. The advantage of being a hydrophobic hormone is that you can go right on through the cell membrane. And since you go right on through the cell membrane and you find your target uh, protein, your receptor, um, you can go right into the nucleus and when, sorry, and once you're in the nucleus, you will usually affect that target cell by having a, um, by changing which genes are transcribed and translated, okay? You'll change gene transcription. So that is our hydrophobic hormone. We're going to start with the hydrophilic hormones at the beginning of the next lecture.